Hello and welcome to this conversation about conscious leadership. My name is Jody Bach and I am a student of leadership, communication, and accountability. I have been a lifelong learner. I am a connector by nature. I love having conversations about things that matter and I am always looking to connect with others on higher ground and maybe in a deeper conversation, which is why I want to share some of these ideas that I've had over the past year around this whole concept of conscious leadership. It was in 2018, January of 2018, that I was introduced to the book Becoming a Conscious Leader. The subtitle is How to Lead Successfully in a World That's Waking Up. And it literally took me the whole year of 2018 to study this book. The only reason I got done by the end of the year was because I had the opportunity to interview the, the author of the book, Gina Hayden, for my podcast. And I had to get done so that I could say I'd actually read the book. So I kind of rushed through the last chapter and then went back later and studied it. So that, would, that took me the whole year. That was 2018. This year of 2019 and into 2020 is about not just learning in theory, but actually putting some of these ideas into practice. And so that's what I want to share with you today um, in the hope that if I share my journey and my understanding and my awakening, that there will be some ideas you might be able to use on your own journey, whatever that journey looks like for you. So. When I think back on, and I'm going to say journey a lot here because I can't think of a better way to say it, the journey of you, joy, journey of you, is really what we're all on if we look at it that way. And it's only in hindsight that we can connect the dots. And I see when I do that, that every decision I've made in my life, every pothole in the road, every de detour that has seemed to take me off the path is actually happening for me and not to me. Now, that's an idea that has continued to evolve as I've often thought of myself as a lone wolf on this journey, trying desperately to fit in instead of to stand out. Now, sometimes it felt like the best way to do that for me was to shave off the corners to fit into the round holes. There were a lot of round holes in my upbringing and my early career, and I'm almost embarrassed to say how many times I tried to do that how to shave, I tried to shave off my square corners to fit. But Brene Brown, who's one of my favorite authors, I'll tell you more about in, in a little bit here. She talks about a fitting in culture where curiosity is seen as weakness and asking questions it equates to antagonism rather than being valued as learning. And boy, if that isn't my story growing up. Now, whether this is actually true or not, isn't really the point. It's the perception of those of us who believed that fitting in was the only option and what that has done to us. Even now, it's become relatively common to use the with me or against me perspective during times of emotional stress. This forces people to take sides and to forget that other perspectives really do exist. It's emotion driven and it often results in more upset than in acceptance. I mean, think about our political arena right now in the US, and it's probably true in other parts of the world. It's that for us or against us mentality. But I digress. This is my story. Um, I share it with you to invite you into a, a, a consideration where if we could at least suspend previous assumptions, even in the time you're listening to this, these thoughts, um, maybe we could come together and learn something. And I love the opportunity to learn something with other people. So I come by my love of words and concepts naturally. And as an English major and a communications major, it, that love grew even stronger. So I'd like to start by introducing a distinction that many people believe to be very similar. It's the distinction between motivation and inspiration. Now, motivation, which is based on fear, comes from the personality, where inspiration, which is based on love, comes from the soul, where motivation is a doing, 
inspiration is a being. Now, this is an important distinction that was first introduced to me by an author named Lance Secretan in his book, Inspire, What Great Leaders Do. Many people believe their role as a leader is to motivate others to achieve something. But look at the greatest leaders in history. Jesus Christ, Gandhi, Mother Teresa, Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, they didn't have as their principal focus to get people to do things. They practiced a way of being. And that way of being inspired, not motivated others to change themselves, which then changed the world. So again, motivation is external based on fear or to provide a motive where inspiration is internal and comes from the Latin word meaning spirit, to breathe, to give life, to infuse with the divine influence. So when you really think about these two words, there is a spiritual dimension to the whole concept of inspiration. And that's what I'd like to talk about here. Now, I mentioned Brene Brown earlier. She's an author, uh, a speaker, a researcher, and her area of ex expertise is shame and vulnerability. Wow, how somebody would pick that is, is remarkable. And I love her work because she invites me to be real and to not worry so much about what other people think. And she says, the universe is not short on wake-up calls. We're just quick to hit the snooze button. And that is curious to me. Why is it that we see and know, even theoretically we might know things, but we stuff it. We pretend not to know. We hope we can just hit the snooze button. So this awakening is happening, whether we're noticing it or not, whether we're stuffing it or not, whether we're hitting the snooze button or not. So I wanna share a story about a leader who found himself in a situation of awakening. Edgar Mitchell was the lunar module pilot of Apollo 14, and he was the sixth person to walk on the moon. He tells about when he was in the command module and he was on his way back from the moon to the earth, how he watched the earth, the moon and the sun passing by the window of the, the command module as it rotated in two minute intervals. And when he had that perspective, nothing in his training had equipped him for that perspective. He, it was like he saw the oneness of all things. He said at one point that he could put his thumb on the earth which really made all the problems he had when he was walking on the earth seem a little less important. And what was what I learned about NASA back then in the Apollo years, they sent military test pilots into space, not poets or preachers. They did everything they could to keep these test pilots from having this awakening because they knew they would lose them. They become poets and preachers if they had this awakening that Edgar Mitchell had. Um, there was one guy, uh, Pete Conrad, they asked him what it was like to go to the moon. They just didn't have words for this. And somebody said, well, so what was it like on Apollo 12? And Pete Conrad said, it was super. I really enjoyed it. Because <laughs> what do you say about a life-altering experience? But then there was Mitchell. After returning to Earth, he left NASA. He grew a beard and divorced his wife. He founded the Institute of Noetic Sciences, which still exists today. And what they do is advocate exploring the universe by means of inquiry that lies outside of science and religion. This could certainly be considered an awakening, an increase in consciousness, wouldn't you say? And that's what you might call a satori, and that's a Japanese term for an instant awakening, comprehension, and understanding. So that can happen. It can be like that. It can be this instant awakening. And one of my other mentors and friends is Steve Farber, author of several leadership books and a former colleague of Tom Peters at the Tom Peters Company. And I have become a certified facilitator of extreme leadership with Steve. And he, Steve's new book is called Love is just damn good business because he's understanding that as we start awakening to these concepts, that maybe it's a Satori, maybe it's a slower awakening in business, we have the opportunity to actually um, talk about love and work in the same sentence. So the dynamic interplay of fear and love are two of the most powerful forces of the human experience. 
And if we can really get good at intentionally using that experience, not getting rid of fear, but noticing it for what it is, and then uh, altering it or, or seeing it with a different set of eyes through the eyes of love, that can change things for the better. And so he calls this extreme leadership, which he says is all about cultivating love, generating energy, inspiring audacity, and providing proof, L-E-A-P, the radical leap is what he calls it. And he says people who do this, who understand this concept of putting love inside organizations, he calls them extreme leadership. Leaders, sorry, he calls them extreme leaders. So another of my favorite authors, oh, by the way, here's Steve and me <laughs> in our um, certification. Another of my favorite authors is Peter Block, and he is a community activist in his community of Cincinnati. I kind of happened upon his work several years ago and fell in love with his way of seeing the world through three of his books. One is called Freedom and Accountability at Work. One is called Community, the Structure of Belonging. And the source of this next quote, which is his book, The Answer to How, is yes. He believes that transformation comes more from pursuing profound questions than seeking practical answers. And this is just about 180 degrees from what I was trained and how I was raised. Because I really did believe that asking questions meant I was stupid that if I didn't have the answer, it must mean I didn't study enough or I wasn't good enough. And when Peter Block gave me permission to become a good question asker, it was like a switch was flipped in my head. And it, I was allowing myself to be who I am for the first time ever. That was my Satori. Of course, Einstein needs to be part of my journey. This quote helped me see that thinking is a huge part of waking up. He says, we can't solve our current problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. Makes sense, doesn't it? He also said, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results is, say it with me, insanity. We cannot solve our current problems with the same thinking that got us here. And then there's Bucky Fuller, Buckminster Fuller, from whom I learned of the law of precession, the effect of bodies in motion on other bodies in motion. Fuller believed that to inspire change, we need to create an alternative paradigm that is more appealing than the current one. Well, duh, would that make sense? Why? Why would we switch if we didn't have something that was more appealing than what we were currently experiencing? Which brings me to January of 2018, when I learned about Gina Hayden's work. She says it's no longer enough for us to simply sprinkle more content on top of our existing leadership mindsets and expect to flourish in our leadership roles. As I said earlier, just as we can't run new software on old operating systems and expect a great performance, what we need in leadership is an upgrade of our operating system itself. She believes that this upgrade is conscious leadership. And she also believes, as do I, that business has the potential to be a huge force for good in the world. And in her book, she actually interviewed 20 business leaders who are using their business as a, I will, I will say, as a container inside of which the people who are employed can all aspire to change the world for the better. There's another way to do business besides competition and warfare. There are movements to support this shift in worldview dedicated to rethinking what we mean by doing good business. So here's Gina and me. I had a chance to interview her on my podcast. She was sitting in London in a club and I was in Fargo, right where I am right now, you can see me. And that was such a fun conversation. And we talked about doing good business and how it's a, a different way, a higher purpose than simply making a profit. So these are the two important views. The second is taking responsibility for the business's impact on the world and then factor that into the way it conducts its profit making activities. Wow, imagine how that would shift the world and the people who are part of that world. 
Now, there's a headiness to being a leader, I get. Um, I'll just share an example. I, I, I used that quote already. I'll share an example. I was a basketball player in college. I was a freshman on this team. I'm number 43 um, with the poodle hair. <laughs> and uh, I'm above uh, the, the person on the right, the picture on the right. I'm, I'm right in the middle of that picture, holding up our trophy as we were winning the national championship my freshman year of college. It's easy to have fame and fortune go to your head. To win as a freshman leaves very little room for improvement, but it is a fantastic way to start your college career. But what I realized in that first year of college is that I was kind of getting, um, not addicted, but I, I, there was something about getting that external validation as part of a team like that. And what I realized as a freshman, people were more interested not in who I was, but in what I did. So because I was part of that team, you know, there's a, there's a headiness to it. And I learned quickly that there's nowhere to go but down once you win the national championship. So for the next three years, I spent my college basketball career trying to get back to this. Never did. Learned a lot in not having a national championship again. Um, and that's another story for another time. Uh, yet when you think about corporate leadership, it can be kind of similar. There's a headiness to it. Um, these guys on this slide know a thing or two about the effects ego can have on a career. You'll see that I have some pictures of Bernie Madoff, Sanjay Kumar, Dennis Kozlowski, Martin Grass, Jeffrey Skilling. All of these people were involved in, um, I would call it ego-based um, business dealings, which got them into trouble. We see it all the time. Ego has us abandon our knowingness in pursuit of higher exposure. This is the old way of being in business. We all suffer from emotional issues about money and blind spots about what money is and whether we are its servants or its masters. So said John Freeman in his book, Reinventing Capitalism, how we broke money and how we fix it from inside and out. What an interesting concept. Wayne Dyer had an acronym for ego that he used a lot in his spiritual study. And he said that E-G-O, ego, stands for edging God out. Now we're well aware of the big ego, which would tempt us to believe we're more than our creator intended for us. That's relatively easy to spot, especially in light of events like those on the screen right here. But there's another dimension to ego that would have us play smaller than our creator intended. That shows up as imposter syndrome. And that's when we hide out in the hope that others won't discover that we aren't enough in our roles as leaders. Both of these ego manifestations have the same effect on our own consciousness. In order to break free from ego's hold on us, whether that's big ego, bullying, or little ego, imposter syndrome, we must upgrade our beliefs about business and change our level of consciousness about it. That's what this book and this study and this understanding has sparked in me. Now, when we as leaders struggle with our own consciousness, it's pretty difficult to expect that our colleagues and employees and team members can wake up. I was hired in one of my first coaching um, jobs to fix a group of employees. I'm going to get to the popcorn in a second. It's not about fixing people. Look at the turbulence that can happen inside an organization, just like inside this popcorn uh, bowl, this popcorn pan. People wake up at different times and in different ways. You'll notice that some of those kernels are already popped. And some of them need agitation. They need the turbulence that can happen in business, in life, to pop and become who we're meant to be. If we spend our time as leaders trying to convince others, we miss out on the opportunities to support those who are waking up. It's so important to realize that we ourselves are on a continuum of awakeness. And if we struggle, is it any wonder those we lead might also be on their own journeys? Some of those, if you look at this popcorn analogy right here, and you'll notice that the heat has to get turned up 
the, the turbulence needs to happen, the agitation, in order for the opportunity to be there for people to pop. Now notice too that some of those kernels are popping out of the pan. The possibility will be that when people are put in a situation where they can understand things or awaken, they might leave. But they, there's an equal possibility that some of them will never pop. And we'll be, what, what do we do when they never pop? Do we continue to turn up the heat on them, hoping they will? And then those that choose to stay, burn up. There must be another way. Consider popcorn when you think about your role as a leader. So the roadmap of characteristics and qualities of those leaders who are leading consciously can be a useful navigational tool for those of us feeling called to this within ourselves. So here are some, some signposts along the way. It starts with us as leaders in our awakening and our understanding of, of new approaches. The leaders then have an impact on their organizations. Conscious leaders lead to conscious organizations. Conscious organizations invite conscious employees and by the time we get to the conscious employees, that's where we really have the opportunity to waken the world. Now, if we don't get this, we will be that organization. We have the potential to be that organization where the heat just continues to get turned up and trying to make people pop. Even when we're not doing the work ourselves as leaders, it has to start with us. Because for a business to evolve, the leader needs to evolve. Leaders set the tone of cultures. They influence many through their decisions. They set direction and make choices that impact either positively or negatively on the lives of others, potentially millions of others. The best way for business to play a role in uplifting the world is to impact the way we as leaders view leadership itself. So this book talks about some qualities of conscious leaders and, and conscious leadership has a great deal to do with, with self leadership. It's not only consigned to those in leadership positions. Conscious and continually evolving leaders become a conduit for others entrusted to them to become better people in the workplace, more engaged, more secure, team oriented, collaborative and innovative problem solvers who are focused on fulfilling a purpose. I might even say it's less about being a problem solver and more about being a possibility seeker. Because if we're focused on problems and we need to solve them, then all we ever are looking for are problems. So there might be another way to think about that. Hayden identifies some key characteristics of those conscious leaders she studied, and they are a sense of connectedness, a sense of service to others and the world, no separation between spirituality and their personal and professional lives. Just imagine what that kind of a workplace would be like. They have the ability to live life in the present moment and accept reality as it is. They have the ability to hold more than one perspective. They have the capacity to set intentions, but be detached from the outcomes. And they experience life with genuine joy, gratitude, and a life-affirming attitude. I would love to believe that this is the majority and it's not yet. We are awakening and you will find that as you journey on this, this path to awake and, and um, conscious leadership that there will be more people out there. And here is her four, Gina Hayden's four zone model of conscious leadership. And in this book, it breaks it down to four areas. And these four areas are the people who have a strong self-awareness and self-mastery. They are being conscious in the way they conduct their relationships. They have a high level of awareness of the interconnectedness between themselves and all of life, which leads to strong systems intelligence and insight. And they have an inner drive to contribute collectively and act responsibly told toward the great whole of which we are all a part. This is what I took notes on for 
12 months. These areas were so fascinating to me because I recognized myself in some of these areas. I recognized where I have done work and I also recognized where I still have work to do. Yet the opportunity to start awakening to this was a pull that I couldn't deny. And as I share more ideas about this topic, I find that there are more people who are waking up and may not have the context yet to know exactly what that means. And this has been uh, a landing place for us, a soft place to come together in a mastermind setting to have a dialogue about these concepts. So although these attributes may seem daunting at first, the idea is progress, not perfection. So the caution is, don't beat yourself up. This is a process. We are dynamic beings on an evolutionary journey. It doesn't matter where we start. Each of us is likely to be drawn to some more than others, and we can listen inwardly to ourselves as to where we'd like to develop next, and we can follow that trail. Each of those qualities that I referenced earlier is a continuum with no endpoint. We're never really done in any of those areas anyway, because it's a continuous improvement journey. So don't get perfectionist, perfectionistic about those four zones. I say that to myself because I call myself a recovering perfectionist. So don't get perfectionistic about those four zones, Jody. <laughs> Use them to ask questions of yourself. It's not possible to cover more than a quick overview in this presentation, but this, I, I hope that this will prompt your thinking. And one of the, the questions to ponder as we kind of think about not ranking ourselves, but being aware of where we might be is what is success? Think about that for yourself as you're listening to this, to me talk about this. If we don't have a definition of success, it's pretty hard to know whether we get closer to it. So a dialogue is created when we agree to suspend previous assumptions in order to learn from each other. And so if this is a question you could hold on to and have a conversation or a dialogue with others inside your organization or in your family or your friends to just find out from each other, what is success really? And, and then when you come up with something, is that something that you came in with? Like something you already had decided or is it something that you created out of the dialogue? Because I'm not here to give you a definition of success, only to have something to jump off of when we go for, forward in this conversation. So the way I would, well, it's not even me, the way Gina Hayden put the idea of success together was through the study she did in these 20 people she interviewed. So many, if not most of them interviewed for this study defined success kind of similarly. They said it was the extent to which they're able to make a difference in the lives of others. They have built a foundation of traditional measures of success, but they've taken this to the next level in the way they now regard being successful on their own. In their own process of discernment, she noted, they are shifting the paradigm of organizational success from me, not you, to us. So they wanna make a difference. They want to experience significance and they want to also experience human happiness. So if we break everything down, the study that she made in this book, which is by the way, very thick, it's a thick book. I read it first on Kindle which I was wondering why it was taking so long because it was big. And as I started reading it on Kindle, I really needed to get the actual book so I could mark it up. And this is what she realized that the, the common denominator for the leaders she identified as conscious leaders who were using their organizations to make a difference in the world beyond only profit were in pursuit of difference. They want to make a difference. They wanted to be significant and they wanted to experience human happiness. So as a true conscious leader, you will realize that by virtue of your being human, you will have three conditions that need to be met in order for you to move forward on your journey. 
you're listening to this, this conversation right now. So you are at least, I would say, ready. I'm going to go past this. You are at least ready to learn more. And also by your interest in being here today, you're demonstrating your ability to learn and grow. The only condition you will need to determine as you go forward is your own willingness. You have to bring that. And what's really fascinating to me about willingness is when you're ready, when you're able, and you shift into that willingness mode where you're, you're ready to say, I'm willing to do whatever it takes, the universe will conspire on your behalf. There are so many ancient studies, ancient books and learnings and teachings that will tell you that. In the 1860s, Ralph Waldo Emerson said, once you make a decision, the universe conspires on your behalf. And that's the willingness. And what you'll find in the willingness piece, you might not actually have to take the, all the action required. Your willingness might open doors where before there were only walls. So be aware of that as you go through this process. So waking up means moving away from being a smaller self and becoming more connected to others and the world. It's when you notice that you are able to incorporate others' viewpoints into your own, you shift from a focus on me to we. And as you wake up, you might find this question not nagging at you. Do you want to get better and better at the dream or do you want to wake up from it? Because if you want to live the life of your dreams, you need to wake up and do something. It's not enough only to dream it. Here's an example of what can happen when people bring their readiness, willingness, and their ability to a new experience. The picture on the left is Carrie Underwood auditioning on American Idol. And her quote of that experience was, it's stupid. What chance do I have? The picture on the right is at the Country Music Award Awards 12 years later. Now, how often are we, each of us, filled with self-doubt? And how many times does the conversation end there? What if Carrie Underwood had listened to her self-doubt and not stepped onto that stage in the first place? Look at that difference in not only how she looks, but how you feel. You can feel her energy just from a still picture. And that's waking up and taking different action. It all starts with a decision. Many of our most inspiring people in the world were not born into greatness. They created their lives with focus, hard work, and dedication to a vision. Important to remember that God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. And the secret, we're all called. We're all called somehow, somewhere. You just need to wake up. So here's some advice for conscious leaders. If you're watching this and you've made it this far in this dialogue and this conversation, I would say you're probably on the brink of becoming a conscious leader. So here are some words of advice. First, what is your catalyst? A catalyst is the path to expanding our own levels of awareness. This will require the shell of our previous selves to crack open, allowing the new version of ourselves to come through. Marianne Williamson is someone I've studied for a long time. She's a spiritual uh, teacher. She says that light, the light could be the light of awareness, the light of God, will enter at the slightest invitation. And sometimes that's when your head cracks open. <laughs> I love that. So we will be getting messages everywhere that are encouraging us to wake up. And if we're hitting that snooze button, we might have to then get a lesson. If we don't get the lesson, we'll get a problem. And if we don't get the problem, it might take a crisis for us to wake up. What are the circumstances of your life that are calling you to become a more enlightened version of yourself. There is support and guidance through coaching, mentoring, masterminding, even therapy, spiritual practice. Some other form of meaning making can aid this process. So look for the catalyst. 
look for or become aware of what makes you feel uncomfortable because that means you're growing out of your comfort zone, which is what you have to do. Second piece of advice, choose hope. On the other side of catalyst or motive is inspiration. When you realize through examples like those from this book or that we've talked about here, that there are breakdowns that lead to breakthroughs, you will realize that anything is possible. When you click into this higher version of yourself, life becomes so much easier. It's a transition for sure, but it's so much more fun to stop resisting to go with the flow instead of against it. Remember that peace in the world begins with peace in me. Next piece of advice is to remember that it's about the journey, not the destination. Get really clear with yourself why you wanna get on this path. It's not a means to, it, to the end, it's an end in itself. You don't become conscious in order to do something you have to be really aware of that. Make sure your journey is about being true to yourself and knowing that this is a lifelong journey. It's not about being attached to the what, it's about discovering the why. It's an unfolding. As you start to understand that you can reward the discipline of awakening and the results will take care of themselves. So take control of what you can control and give up trying to control those things you can't. Next, ask the deep questions. Humility beyond hubris, which is ego, enables you to really look at yourself because it takes a lot to critically look at yourself as a leader. It's when you ask those fundamental questions like, what is my purpose and why am I here, that you begin that journey to transform yourself and become more aware and more conscious. Self-reflection is a key to opening up and asking the deep questions is a way to do that. Either get into a mastermind group with someone else you trust or begin by journaling. It'll be a great way for you to start taking a look at some of those deeper questions. Decide on the impact you want to make. Figure out what's really important to you. The person who can focus and get really clear on the impact he or she wants to make in amidst the millions of possibilities that are out there is the one who can make all the difference. This will allow you to begin to attract others with complementary skills to be able to leverage yourself and who may want to work in a similar direction. Focus is key so you can make a deeper rather than a wider impact. And finally, just jump in. Reading books, gathering information, getting ready to get ready will never allow you to utilize the knowledge and get it to knowingness. Knowledge is in your head and you can get it from reading a book, but knowingness is in your heart and gut. And it's what happens after all the books go away and all that stuff that is stuck in your head needs a place to come out. Don't dip your toe in. Go all in and try it out. Talk to people who are intriguing. Watch things that inspire you. Create a practice. There's a great book called The Miracle Morning uh, that would help on this path. Or do meditation, yoga, painting. LifeWorks, lifeworks.university is a great way to learn and meet people who are on this journey. Whatever it is, find something that inspires you. Be observant of your emotional state and what it will take to be fully present. So conscious leadership is not a position. It's a way of being. It's less about the title conscious leader and more about the act of leading consciously. Leading consciously is about self leadership before it's about other leadership. Your journey of waking up is your own. And as you awaken, your own light will dawn as a beacon for others. You cannot help but impact those around you through your way of being. This is the adventure of conscious leadership. So thank you for taking some time to ponder these deep thoughts with me today and to 
begin your own journey of conscious leadership. If we all begin to wake up, we will realize by looking around that we aren't alone on this journey. There are others waiting for us to have those deeper and more meaningful conversations about how we can impact our old organizations in a way that we get beyond the profit making only to making a difference in the world. And I would love to invite you to join this journey uh, wherever you can find the people waiting for you. LifeWorks University is where I'm finding my connections and I'd love to invite you to take a look at us, lifeworks.university and see whether that is a place that can inspire you to live the life of your dreams by waking up. Thanks everybody, this has been Jody Bach, Dean of LifeWorks University. I'm grateful for you and excited to see you on uh, another part of our journey together. Take care.